Gente, boa noite. É, eu sou a Bárbara Simão e eu sou coordenadora de pesquisa da área de privacidade e vigilância do Internet Lab, que é a área responsável por organizar o congresso. É, eu queria fazer uma introdução para vocês, contando um pouco melhor do que, que a gente planejou para essa semana. Mas é, eu quero primeiro passar a palavra para a Zade, que é a nossa primeira keynote, porque ela está na Europa. E o fuso horário europeu já está bem ingrato para ela, né? Ela está gentilmente aqui acompanhando o evento. É, então, eu vou começar passando a palavra para ela, depois a gente vai seguir para o Andrew, que é o segundo keynote, e depois a gente, eu faço um, um apanhado geral para contar um pouquinho mais para vocês do que, que a gente pensou. Então, eu vou começar apresentando a Azade. Né? A Azade Akbari é professora assistente em Administração Pública e Transformação Digital na Universidade de Twente, nos Países Baixos. Ela também é co-diretora da Rede de Estudos de Vigilância e criou a Rede de Estudos sobre Vigilância do Sul Global. Ela estudou... Ops, parece que está tendo algum problema aqui. Ah, então, a, a Daz Ekbari é professora assistente em Administração Pública e Transformação Digital na Universidade de Twente, nos Países Baixos. Ela também é co-diretora da Rede de Estudos de Vigilância e criou a Rede de Estudos sobre Vigilância do Sul Global. Ela estudou Sociologia e Jornalismo no Irã, além de pesquisa de gênero na London School of Economics and Political Sciences. Ela obteve seu doutorado em Geografia Humana na Universidade de Heidelberg. Em seguida, ela se juntou à Universidade de Münster como pesquisadora pós-doutoranda em Geografia Política. Ela atuou como jornalista por muitos anos e trabalhou como gerente de comunicação e especialista em engajamento comunitário na Unicef e British Council. Azade, thank you so much for being here and for accepting your invitation. Uh, the floor is yours. You have 30 minutes for your speech and then we'll have a brief moment for Q&A with the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Um, You're just starting your evening. It's um, 23.20 here in Northwestern Germany, where I live. So um, forgive me if I forget words and my brain stops working in the middle, but um, I'm happy to be with you. And I'm very, um, it's a huge pleasure to attend this conference. Um, surveillance studies um, has a very, long tradition, um, unfortunately, in South America, and I'm very good friends with um, the surveillance network in, in South America, Levitz, and they're doing some really interesting stuff um, and reports. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, surveillance and democracy in the global South today. Um, and it's quite an important topic for me. I founded the Surveillance in the Global South Network. Um, at the end of my PhD studies, because I had a feeling that a lot of uh, the discourse and scholarship in the surveillance studies is Western dominated. Um, and I really wanted to start a space um, to talk about maybe non-Western experiences of surveillance and how surveillance technologies are being used um, in the countries of the global South. Um, oh, I have some slides, if you can... Um, If I could share them would be nice. Okay, yeah. great. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually also talking about these glitches in, in digital communication today as well. So um, it's, um, it's good that it finally worked. So I'm talking about surveillance and democracy in the global south today. Um, and it's a difficult topic, um, I'm pretty sure. Um, especially for me, because when we talk about the global south, we are accepting a kind of world order and uh, a south-north divide that it already packs inside itself. Um, and a, a very um, specific understanding of how the things function and how the world order functions in our time. But um, let's, let's, for the sake of discussion, talk about the global south, but obviously, I'm going to highlight today um, how difference um, plays a role um, in how we understand the Global South. Um, countries of the Global South have different histories, different sociopolitical backgrounds, and this is something that shouldn't be lost when we talk about um, the Global South. Today, um, as I'm talking to you, it's almost um, the anniversary of the killing of Massa Amini in Iran 
um, she was a normal woman walking down the street, um, picked up by the morality police, and unfortunately killed in custody of them, which has started a feminist revolution in Iran, if you have been following the news in the last year. Um, and I have written about this um, movement, but also specifically about surveillance and internet governance um, in Iran and in, the, in other authoritarian countries. Um, this has been the topic of my research for, for the last uh, seven years. And I think this um, movement is, a, is, a, is quite an interesting example of how these countries, um, authoritarian countries, are dealing with um, new technologies and generally how they um, sort of um, digitally govern their societies. So here, for example, is a screenshot that I, I accidentally found in um, within a discussion between two Twitter accounts, pro-regime Twitter accounts um, on, on Twitter at the time. Um, this shows um, a software for censoring TV series and films in Iran. And this woman, for example, has been marked by the algorithm as showing cleavage in a nightclub. And the system uh, marks these kind of abnormalities, as the software calls them. And the, through machine learning, the system learns how to censor um, um, undesirable or un-Islamic, for example, scenes from TVs, um, from TV series and films. Again, um, last year, exactly at this time, um, there was this confrontation in a bus between a pro-regime woman that was Pro covering um, uh, female bodies and so on, and and a woman that sort of resisted this by taking off her um, her hijab and her head headscarf. Um, people started filming this uh, scene, and at the end, women got together and threw out this uh, pro regime woman out of the bus. Six hours later, the other protester woman was arrested. And at the time, it was quite interesting that, uh, you know, you do a lot of research and sometimes it is not very um, applicable for the public. But at the time, the Guardian reporter, um, a Guardian reporter found my research and she called me and she was like, how is this possible? And for, for, for a person that has been working on these kind of um, use of technology, surveillance technologies in Iran, I tried to explain um, how Iranian authorities are using facial recognition to enforce um, hijab law, for example, in Iran. And this uh, use of technology on public transport is basically a continuation of controlling women's bodies and sexuality and, and the clothing. So this is, this is one good example at the anniversary of this movement to look at the ways that the authoritarian regimes are using digital technologies. Obviously, there is resistance against that. So what you can see is a sexual harassment a collective mapping uh, developed by women uh, as a way of um, public awareness raising that sexual harassment happens in public spaces. This is um, a sexual health application on a sexual health um, uh, platform um, page on Instagram. There is no sex education, for example, in Iran. This is this is people who are talking about sexual uh, health and so on. This one is about sexual harassment at the workplace, and this is a picture of a woman that climbed on an electric electricity box on the Revolution Street, and she put her head scarf on top of a stick and waited there in silence for the police to arrest her. And her picture went completely viral. And the next day. A lot of women across Iran did the same thing. This is about not only the power of surveillance technologies, but also the power of these technologies for resistance movements to express themselves. Um, this power also makes sort of de de demonstrates itself. I mean, think about the campaigns that have been going on in, in the last year, for example, during the women life freedom movement in Iran, for example. People have advocated for um, taking down the CCTV cameras, destroying them, and so on. This is one of my favorite pictures from the campaign that women have actually covered a CCTV camera in, in, in Tehran's underground with menstrual pads. And next to it, you see a hashtag of a name of an activist. And you see how these hybrid places, um, hybrid spaces of um, virtual and physical come together. It's the female body extending itself against the, the gaze of controlling and the gaze of controlling um, female bodies. So 
this is not only the digital technologies, but the international, the global trend in how internet is being governed, how internet governance, digital governance discourses are moving across the world. And not only between um, what we had seen before, a colonial movement of technologies from the global north to the global south, but also transfer of technologies and ideas and technosocial imaginaries between the authoritarian governments. As we can see, internet shutdowns, this is a report by Access um, for internet shutdown, shutdowns in 2022, and it's being constantly updated. As you can see, there is a trend, increasing trend of um, internet shutdowns. It happens all across the world, in, in India, in Iran, in uh, Ethiopia, in Russia. And it seems more and more that the authoritarian governments know that know the power of internet and in times of crisis they just shut down the internet um i've been on different um panels in the european commission in U uh, un internet governance forum and so on because this increasing trend of internet shutdowns is very um worrisome for the for the access and for also for the freedom of global internet so there are things that are happening um, across the world. Um, that are quite interesting. Um, this is also to show how people are trying to access to the free global Internet through despite all these uh, barriers and difficulties is this um, screenshot of an Iranian users. Uh, mobile phone. As you can see, there are so many VPN applications installed on this phone just to, just to have access um, to the global internet. So I'm going to talk about talk you through some of these uh, problems um, in in a matter of um, under the subject of authoritarian surveillance. This has been something that has become is becoming more and more important and dominant in the discourses of surveillance and and the literature on surveillance but when we look at it it is also important um, maybe to think could any act of arbitrary or oppressive surveillance be categorized as authoritarian surveillance what is exactly authoritarian surveillance and does authoritarian surveillance necessarily correspond to an authoritarian state form? We have seen in, in NSA data collection in different democratic countries that surveillance technologies are being used in an authoritarian way. So how can we actually really define um, authoritarian surveillance? So I'm trying to answer some of these questions tonight. And to give you a historical background, not that um, the South American, uh, Americans are, um, foreign to this kind of history, this is this is partly your history and also my history, um, that how we moved from totalitarianism to democracy, or have we ever moved to, to, from, from totalitarianism to democracy, and what kinds of democracies are available now? So in after the um, Second World War, we have a lot of theorization of, um, of totalitarianism. And the, at the time, it was said that political systems with limited, not responsible political pluralism without elaborate and guiding ideology, without um, intensive, more extensive political mobilization, and in which a leader or occasionally a small group exercises power within formally ill-defined limits, but actually quite predictable ones, is a totalitarian regime. Um, after the things that happening, um, a lot of countries were becoming independent of colonial relations, and a lot of international interference was going on in, in, in those newly independent countries. Um, then in a decade later, we, we see that, for example, it says that South American accounts were more concentrated more on the level of modernization rather than mobilization or pluralism. It, it is at the time that the discourse of development and modernization is injected to many countries, but there is also a national effort for modernization and how, how these countries wanted to define modernization. And th this idea matches traditional populist and bureaucratic authoritarianism with low, medium, and high levels of mo modernization. So Odanel, for example, tries to find a model of how people sort of, um, how, how different regimes are placed in this matrix 
uh, in relation to also their efforts to modernization. And finally, uh, a group of um, people who were studying um, totalitarianism, they came together and they had this extensive study of democracy in developing countries where they define a continuum between pseudo-democracies to semi-democratic systems. Um, and then put different countries on this continuum. But again, interestingly, um, at the turn of the century, when, when we sort of entered the new century, this whole idea about how totalitarian systems and authoritarian regimes work starts to change. Um, we, we used to think that democracy is a stable model and the authoritarianism and um, authoritarian regimes are unstable forms on their way to democracy. What happened was at the turn of the century was observing that a lot of these regimes are actually very stable. So semi-authoritarian systems, it was said, are not imperfect democracies struggling toward improvement and consolidation, but regimes determined to maintain the appearance of democracy without exposing themselves to the political risks that free competition entails. So now we have this appearance of democracy. People still vote. There, there are elections, but it is not a democratic participation per se. So the new theories of authoritarianism still struggle with this fact of stability, and they, they talk about new formations of, <clears throat> of a state, compet like competitive authoritarianism, constitutional oligarchies or exclusive republics, um, military or monarchic authorities or restricted or semi-competitive democracies. So we see that authoritarianism in itself also becomes uh, very um, differently uh, for, uh, formed. So from this moment on, um, in the history of political uh, state forms, we see that democracy is much more than a system for making decisions. It is also an idea, a doctrine, a set of institutional arrangements and a way to relate to others. So democracy is sort of taken from that only political um, um, dimension and a social dimension is added to democracy. Um, this kind of, this idea of democracy is also happening in, in a globalized world. Um, and it, with the transfer of technologies, but also surveillance technologies to a lot of countries. And there's a, there's a huge background of talking about surveillance societies and in these authoritarian regimes and so on. And as Murakami Wood says, while surveillance is involved with processes of globalization, it is also not necessarily the same surveillance society that one sees in different places and at different scales. Surveillance is historically, spatially, and culturally located. So as much as we are seeing different forms of authoritarianism, we also see different forms of surveillance societies. And these two things are not necessarily corresponding to each other. Again, the idea of authoritarian surveillance initially was used to address surveillance in post-authoritarian societies, especially in, the, uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, 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 and it was parting away from that idea of liberation, li liberation technologies or liberatory technologies. This was the idea that if you have a society, just give them the, the, the necessary technologies, people would start participating, there would be freedom of expression, democracy would happen in itself, democracy would happen automatically. Technology in itself has a liberatory nature. Just one year after these claims, McKinnon writes about governments with network authoritarianism, that the governments such as China are learning quickly and pouring unprecedented resources into building their capacity to influence and shape digital communication networks. And people started, scholars, academics, activists started to realize that network platforms are not intrinsically democratic and can be tools of oppression. So technology is, is not, does not have a liberatory nature, <clears throat> it even could be used for oppression, for oppression, control and surveillance. Um, so in the global south, when we talk about turning the turn to authoritarianism, this is something again coming from Western literature that everybody, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we heard a lot of that, that there's a turn to authoritarianism in these countries. 
And in the global south, <clears throat> it makes little sense to talk of a turn to authoritarianism. <clears throat> it's rather the situation is one in which authoritarianism is both constantly likely and often seems necessary or more attractive than the alternatives. There is a long history of different forms of authoritarianism in these countries. So we see there is a conceptual disarray. It's difficult to conceptualize what authoritarian surveillance could mean uh, for activists, politicians, researchers from different disciplinary, political, and national backgrounds. People have written about these things, um, especially through surveillance assemblage. For example, in Turkey, I've written with a colleague about um, surveillance assemblages in Iran and Russia. And other people have been um, studying authoritarian as well as illiberal practices rather than the fairness of national elections alone. So they talked about democracy or authoritarianism as practices rather than the state form, which is very useful when we when we are thinking about um, authoritarian surveillance practices in democratic um, countries. So what I'm trying to say here, and I, I also mentioned it at the beginning of my talk that authoritarian surveillance is situated at the intersection of many other historical, political, colonial, global, cultural, economic, and social strands. And any research on authoritarian surveillance should position itself in this intersection, considering the continuities, disjunctions, and frictions amongst these different aspects. So for me, the researcher uh, herself or himself also has a responsibility to reflect on these histories, to position himself or herself in, in this um, intersection <clears throat> um, of difference. To show you one example, and this is, um, I'm giving you two examples of my current research. My current research um, is about authoritarian smart cities, and smart cities have also been an example of digital um, sort of governance that is constantly being discussed about. You hear about smart city as if always the smart city is a positive thing. It's on UN agendas, it's on different countries, national programs and strategic policies and so on. And even if you look at the number of articles that have been published about the smart cities in academic journals, you see that the, after the ratification of the SDGs, the trend is really increasing really fast. And it seems that smart city is, is really a very important topic, something essential to the urban governance and something is essential to the digital governance of any country. There is obviously criticism against this um, um, increasing body of literature on the smart cities. Obviously, there is um, there is literature about massive failures in the World Bank's ICT for development programs and also UN's um, development programs that include smart city programs, um, some, some um, scholars argue that the smart city in itself is a surveillance, surveillance city or a security city, and they underline the central place of surveillance in, in the smart city projects. <clears throat> Others have written about the disciplinary aspects of smart cities in producing docile subjects and mechanisms of political legitimization, that, that bodies that move inside the city are exposed um, are um, expected to behave in a, in a certain way. So it sort of uh, controls and surveils bodies that do not fit to this kind of um, sensory uh, cognitive city. There is, a, again, critique of this criticism because people have criticized smart cities, but they depict the smart city as a universal, rational, and depoliticized project that largely plays out according to the terms of profit maximizing multinational technology companies. So um, this idea of a smart city as a universal rational thing that could be fitted into every society is being criticized. And the way to understand it better and the way to deal with this problem is to consider in depth empirical case studies of a specific smart city initiatives and comparative research that contrast smart city developments in different locales. So what I'm arguing is that not only there is this criticism of a histor historicity, universalism, um, and profit um, based sort of an analysis of a smart city, but also it seems that it's, there is not much attention paid to political systems in which smart cities are embedded. And hence, I'm um, 
researching about authoritarian smart cities. What is interesting for me is that how um, authoritarian regimes dream that, um, about smart cities. To be exact, what is the socio-technical imaginaries involved in thinking about the smart cities in these countries? If, if authoritarian regimes are already using surveillance technologies to control the populations, how does a smart city look like um, in, in those countries? Um, a lot of the times when we talk about this, these problems, um, they are linked to, to inefficient or bad governance and not seen as the symptoms of underlying political systems that cause social injustice, environmental catastrophes, and inadequate infrastructure in the first place. There are so many examples of smart city programs that they work on e-participation without really um, taking any paying any attention that there is, if there is participation or democratic agency possible in that context. And they are also reluctant to historical and contextual political elements of urban governance in, the, in these countries. So smart city, when we say it's depoliticized, it is apolitical, ahistoricized, it means that people are not really paying attention to the politics of that place in the first place. And there's an anecdotal ap approach to these political contexts. <clears throat> so um, as an example, I wanted to show you this video um, it's um, probably you would see it a bit fragmented, but um, and the, the, the sound is not that important. This is um, an example of a smart city um, in, in an authoritarian regime. This is uh, the line, Neum, a uh, smart city in Saudi Arabia. It's a linear city completely um, filled with sensors. Drones above are policing the city and um, this city is not built and I really don't think that it will ever be built, but this is sort of the marketing material. And I wanted to, you to see that kind of imaginaries um, of a smart city. I What a wonderful So this is quite interesting in a sense if you if um, if you're familiar with the history of um, Saudi Arabian government's violation of women's rights of um, of the exclusion of different genders and sexualities in that context. It's quite an interesting and shocking video in a sense to see um, a woman without any um, you know, covering is running across the city. It, it has that ideal of a family that is quite a strange to the Saudi Arabian culture. But the smart city in this imaginary sort of resolves all, all sorts of uh, cultural and his, uh, historical um, uh, contexts of, of that country. It is also, again, interesting that for, for building this uh, linear city, which they, it's not only a smart city, but it's a cognitive city because everything is connected through AI. Um, they moved a lot of indigenous groups um, from, from the desert. So it already really literally sort of erasing those histories um, of that place. So what I'm suggesting for conceptualizing authoritarian surveillance um, is, as I said, not only the, those authoritarian practices in democratic contexts that we are quite familiar with because this happens a lot in, um, in, in Western contexts, but also using surveillance technologies for maintaining autoc autocratic power. Um, another strand of research that I'm very much interested in is authoritarian structure and governance of platform, corp uh, platform corporations. It is quite interesting to see how, for example, um, Mark Zuckerberg uh, governs Meta or 
um, how Elon Musk is taking control of Twitter and changing everything there. And these models of governance are very authoritarian. So when we talk about authoritarianism, we are talking about authoritarianism in different levels and different contexts, and it could be conceptualized differently also in these different um, uh, in different contexts. Um, another, so we have talked about maybe let's say macro level of uh, politics, but it's it's also very interesting for me, and this is the second project that I just uh, submitted a chapter about this, um, about the micro level um, um, of of ex experiencing uh, these kind of control and um, um, political also um, engagement. So it's we we also read a lot about e citizenship and citizenship in smart cities. But what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to bear rights? And what who is a human in in a smart city? So this is about how we imagine humans in future smart cities, or how we are experiencing it and on our human bodies. Um, so this is also interesting that at the turn of the century, because of the rapid uh, process of datafication, we we see a lot of discussion about surveillance assemblage, for example. And surveillance assemblage operates by abstracting human bodies from their territorial settings, separating them into a series of discrete fl flows. And these flows are then reassembled in different locations as discrete and virtual data doubles. And we constantly hear about this data double. There is a human and there is a data double. There is a digital shadow. And um, the bodies are starting disappearing. And even Zuboff um, writes about this, that the body is simply a set of coordinates in time and space where sensation and action are translated as data. So I, this is, for example, one, um, one table I have put together with a PhD student that it shows, for example, that the categories of personal data stored in different EU immigration data banks. And as you can see, biometric data, like fingerprints, facial image, but also genetic data and DNA data is being uh, being uh, saved in these data banks. What does this mean? What does this do to our bodies? And I argue that our bodies are becoming, the materiality of our bodies are becoming more and more central uh, to these surveillance assemblages. Here is a Guardian report about how um, asylum seekers are burning the, their fingertips to get around um, the Dublin regulation that sends the refugees to their country of arrival, mostly Italy and Greece, um, and they don't want to stay in those countries. These are the Eastern European borders where heartbeat detectors and thermal cameras are used to, to identify people on the border. So the body is constantly betraying the person um, that is inside. The person is deemed to be deceitful and the body is the truthful uh, that shows this person, shows who they are. Um, the heartbeat sort of betrays the person. This is again um, another example. Uh, when China started the iris scanning thing for shopping, the Western media were full of that, um, sort of for, full of news and reports about that. But at the very same time, UNHCR started in, a, uh, in Zatari camp in Jordan to do iris scanning for uh, cash assistance for refugees. Uh, working with this company, arguing that um, um, refugees are forgetting their, their uh, debit cards, passports, or they are using the money for something else, or they they um, lose their card. So iris scanning was uh, introduced um, to this uh, refugee camp. And the body is not only um, something that is being datafied, mediated, it's not a double anymore. The body itself becomes a way of payment. The body itself becomes the bearer of the border. And this very much resonates with the way that we understand um, space and code in this time. So we, we all know about coded space. If I was there with you, unfortunately, I couldn't be there with you. But if I was standing there and delivering this presentation, then it would be a coded space. I, if, if my computer crashed, then I would be still there and deliver my presentation. But we live in a code space at this moment. If my computer, hopefully not happening, but if my computer crashes, then there would be no presentation. So this is a code of space. The code and a the space, they have a dyadic relationship. They, they co-constitute each other. If there is no code, there is no space. And if there is no space, there is no code. This is, again, applicable to, to the body. So if Foucault talks about the corporeal space, 
we also, the, the corporeal space also becomes a code space. So we are experienced the code body. Um, our bodies do not exist without the code and the code doesn't exist without our bodies. So what does it mean for the future? I argue that the code body is a prerequisite for the smart city. This, this way of datafication of body and centrality of body to this system um, of control and surveillance is, is important for the smart city to work. And socio-technical imaginaries of authoritarian reg regimes re realize dreams of seamless control and surveillance through these surveillance assemblages and through the code bodies. Obviously, at, at the other side, resistance and movements develop a technological dimension and also happens in hybrid, virtual, physical um, spaces. And we see in, in, the, inter, inter, in the international uh, scene that there is an emerging discourse of internet or digital governance, and there is this collaboration between South South countries, for example, a lot of countries, when it comes to digital IDs, they wanted to um, use the Indian central model instead of uh, the decentralized model. Um, so we see this kind of collaboration and this, um, uh, this discourse between different imaginaries between authoritarian governments. And this would be interesting to see what kind of new political forms and global order these discourses uh, would give rise to. I'm going to stop here and um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Azadeh. I think this was a brilliant speech and we sure begin with a really good note. Um, I'll switch to Portuguese so I can speak to the audience. Um, pessoal, tudo bem? <laughs> É, a gente tem pouco tempo para perguntas disponíveis, porque justamente para preservar o tempo da professora que está num fuso horário diferente do nosso, mas acho que dá para a gente abrir talvez para duas ou três perguntinhas, uma rodada, e, e aí a gente pode passar para o Andrew, que é o próximo. Alguém quer fazer perguntas? Ah, Chico. Olá, boa noite, professora. A minha pergunta vai no sentido da, de pedir um retrato global dessa prevalência né, do discurso de cidades inteligentes. Então, na sua percepção, quais são os continentes, especialmente no sul global, ou países mais afetados, é, enfim, o exemplo do Oriente Médio é muito interessante, mas mesmo no Brasil, assim, acho que faz sentido a gente ouvir um pouco quais são as pontas de lança desse processo, na sua opinião, e quais são as características atravessadas pelo, pelos diferentes marcadores que, que você estava comentando, né? É, históricos, é, regionais, etc. É isso. Okay, if I've understood the question correctly. Um, yeah, I agree that, um, and I tried to highlight that in my talk as well, that I think um, this universal idea of smart city is not applicable um, to each and every country with the same kind of approach. So each country um, has its own sort of context and history in dealing with this um, with this uh, new smart city projects. We have seen even in the Western countries, we have seen wonderful, for example, data initiatives in Barcelona, how they deal with, with that. We have seen um, how um, there are many different examples how smart city projects were rolled out. But as a person that also has the experience of working for um, for different United Nations agencies, it it has been it is been my experience that a lot of the times there is a global level program for smart cities and smart cities is being the future thing, um, and it sort of is being rolled out to the countries without really considering what is the context of that country. Um, one one funny example would be uh, that World Bank. It used to be like that really in the nineties at the World Bank. Um, representatives would go to a, a village and because at the time participation was a big board um, they, they tried to 
have some participatory approach who would be in the village at the at the main square to participate in these discussions mostly men um women um and a lot of other minority groups were sort of excluded from these discussions this is one very small example to show how these uh, large scale projects when they are implemented in in a smaller scale they sort of really they are reluctant to how things work in those countries and in a lot of authoritarian systems um participation in itself is very complicated so um I can give you a lot of examples how how this this is very dependent on the context, but I think I've highlighted the point that um, this is very um, context um, dependent. Obrigada, Zade. Um, não sei se alguém tem mais algumas perguntas. Se tiver esse, ah, Benjana. É melhor, acho que é melhor ele estar aqui. Obrigada, muito obrigada pela apresentação, pela, pela conferência. É, eu gostaria, se tiver mais uns minutinhos, né, perguntar um pouco é, em relação à sua pesquisa, o que você identificou é, em relação à resistência, aos processos de resistência? Você comenta muito rapidamente na apresentação de que eles têm, eles são híbridos e também é, são desenvolvem um processo tecnológico de alguma forma. É, então, se, se você pudesse contar um pouquinho mais para a gente sobre é, isso, seria interessante. Obrigada. Sure. Um... I'm, I'm trying to give an uh, optimistic answer about that because I, I, I actually studied the resistance part for quite a long time. And there, there was a still um, a lot of hope that these, how these things um, work together. Um, how activists, for example, can use these platforms, can use digital technologies also in, in, in countering um, um, those um, controlling oppressive measures. But more and more um, we are witnessing that uh, some oppressive measures such as internet shutdowns are really threatening to not only digital rights but also human rights of people, um, of users in these countries. It, it becomes, um, and today right before this keynote um, I, had a, I had another interview with The Guardian and I was trying to explain how in, in, in authoritarian regimes such as Iran, um, for example, if you if you manage to have an interoperable system between different data banks, if the government, for example, uses CCTV cameras with facial recognition technology, and at the same time, because of the digitalization of national identification system has a data bank of all faces of all citizens in the country. And if these things to work together, so if people go on the streets and all the faces are recognizable by the technology and they have the data of all faces, then there is no privacy, there is no way of resisting on the streets. So this, this sort of technological trap becomes sort of uh, more and more difficult to resist. But at the same time, what is very interesting, and I'm also writing about this, is about technological solidarity. So we have seen, for example, in the case of Iran, what has happened during this movement was that a lot of um, con a lot of companies, private companies, private technology companies, such as Signal, such as WhatsApp, um, a, a lot of VPN countries, Skype for a very short, limited amount of time, they try to uh, sort of technologically assist people that are inside the country. Um, and they were trying to access um, um, these platforms and have and communicate with the outside world. So this is a new concept that you see. This is not only from the people inside, like the big data initiatives we have seen, collective mapping using platforms, but also now um, we talk about these um, private stakeholders all the time in development context, but these private companies also, interestingly, now are becoming um, more involved, not only in digital governance part and in, in giving, in supporting governments, but also in supporting a resistance movement. So this is an interesting um, new development that, that I'm writing about at the moment. Um, again, 
um, for example, if you look at Afghanistan, when the um, coalition um, uh, forces, United Nations and World Bank left Afghanistan, they left the biometric data banks and identification data banks in Afghanistan. Um, and Taliban basically had access to all the information, biometric data of people who had worked with the, with the coalition. And obviously these people were completely in danger because if they tried to leave their neighborhood or try to cross the border, they would immediately be identified. So these systems are making it even more difficult for people who are trying to resist them. And in that sense, we not only need the solidarity of you know, different hackers, um, programmers, and so on, and activists and digital rights activists, but also, interestingly, private companies that can actually develop technologies specifically for these resistance movements. Muito obrigada, Azade. Um, eu queria dizer que foi um prazer escutar a sua palestra. Eu aprendi muito e acredito que grande parte da nossa audiência aqui... É, você não está vendo o auditório, mas a gente tem um auditório cheio de pessoas aqui que ficaram muito encantadas com, com a sua palestra e que gostaram muito de todo o conteúdo riquíssimo que você trouxe. Inclusive, a gente recebeu um pedido para você, se puder compartilhar depois o link desse anúncio que você é, passou o um videozinho no YouTube. Acho que seria legal para a gente depois compartilhar com o pessoal para... É, eles conseguirem ver também. É, bom, acho que isso. Sure, it was a pleasure to be with you. Um, I really enjoyed. Uh, please enjoy a cocktail on my behalf. <laughs> and I hope, I really hope that I made sense uh, because it's very late um, here. And um, I really wish you a wonderful conference and enjoy the rest. Thank you very much for your invitation and your attention. Thank you so much, Azad. Thank you for, for being with us, even if online. Um, então, bom, é, Azad, se você quiser já ir, eu imagino que já esteja super tarde aí, a gente vai te liberar. É, e a gente vai passar agora para o nosso segundo keynote, que é o Andrew Ferguson, que é professor de Direito na American University Washington College of Law. É, não sei se está tudo certo com o professor Andrew, vou conferir aqui se o áudio dele está funcionando tudo bem, se ele está conseguindo é, escutar a gente. Andrew, um, hi, good evening. Um, are you being able to hear me? Everything okay? I can hear you, yes. Uh, yes? Yes. Okay, so um, do, do you activate the translation? Because we have translation available for you. Yeah, uh, have to activate it. Yeah, have to activate it in this bar below the, the screen. Got it. Okay. I think I'm good. So let's just check if everything's um, if everything's working. I'll switch to Portuguese so we can test. Um, bom, gente. Então a gente vai passar agora para o Andrew Ferguson. Que é, e vai, que vai falar sobre o uso de Big Data nas investigações policiais, o que é super interessante, porque a gente veio de um discurso mais abrangente relacionado à vigilância e autoritarismo no sul global de maneira mais abrangente, e agora a gente vai passar para esse ponto um pouco mais específico. É, o professor Andrew, ele é professor da American University Washington College of Law, ele leciona e escreve na área de processo penal, evidências e tecnologias de justiça criminal. Ele é um especialista nacional em policiamento preditivo, vigilância de big data, internet das coisas, juris e a quarta emenda dos Estados Unidos. Durante dois anos como bolsista Pritman, ele ensinou e supervisionou estudantes clínicos do terceiro ano envolvidos na clínica de justiça criminal. Logo após a formatura na Faculdade de Direito, ele trabalhou como assistente judicial da Honorable Chief Judge Carolyn Dinning King do Tribunal de Apelações dos Estados Unidos para o Quinto Círculo. É, Andrew, você terá 30 minutos para sua palestra e de, em seguida a gente vai abrir um breve momento para perguntas da plateia. É, é um prazer tê-lo aqui conosco, uma honra tê-lo conosco e queria agradecer imensamente por ter aceito o nosso convite para participar desse painel. Andrew, você está com a palavra, pode iniciar a sua palestra, estamos todos animados por aqui para te ouvir. 
Great. Um, should I share my uh, slides or was that going to happen on your end? You can share it. You can share it. All right. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes, we're seeing it. That's great. Well, first, um, thank you very much for the honor of uh, presenting uh, to you. Uh, it is a, a joy to uh, uh, speak across countries uh, with similar uh, problems of how new technologies are changing police power, how they are infringing on, on uh, personal privacy, and how they threaten a real authoritarian uh, regime. You know, they create authoritarian regimes in ways that uh, I think there are some real um, parallels uh, in the history of the U.S., the recent history of the U.S., and the recent history of Brazil. Um, I'm going to focus my talk mo mostly on the American uh, situation, because that's what I know best. Um, but I think you'll hear uh, echoes of some of the concerns. And what I'm going to share with you today is a work uh, that is part of a book project uh, called When Everything is Evidence, that you all are uh, some of the first people to uh, uh, hear. Uh, and basically what it talks about is how our worlds are changing based on a new world of digital technologies, the smart devices that we are buying for ourselves and putting in our homes, as well as the very powerful big data technologies that governments are using to uh, police all of us. So I want to begin just to make this real with a very small scale criminal prosecution story. It takes place in a small rural area of Virginia. This is not fancy high tech policing, but it really is going to be the future of what we see in America and what we see across the world as new technologies change police power. And it all begins with one of those uh, small forklifts, those little sort of uh, uh, forklifts you can see in the back of a pickup truck. Um, those are valuable, heavy equipment. They can be resold for lots of money, and they tend to be the target of thefts. And so in this small rural you know, farm country area of Virginia, uh, there was a series of thefts. Uh, the way the thefts would happen is someone would first steal a truck, a pickup truck, and they drive to usually an abandoned heavy uh, machinery dealership, not abandoned that there weren't people there, but the times you sell heavy machinery, it's not all the time, like you basically make an appointment. So lots of times these big areas were left without a whole lot of people. And they steal a truck, a pickup truck, they drive into this place, they load up the forklift, they take the forklift, they then take the pickup truck, ditch the pickup truck, get rid of it, and then sell the heavy equipment. And it kept happening. And police were confused about how to stop it uh, because the pickup trucks were always discarded, so they didn't really have a clue. And then they realized that the thief, uh, the guy they were going to target, uh, had the misfortune of picking up a rather new pickup truck that had GPS location on it. And that was only partially helpful uh, because it allowed you to see where the pickup was when it was stolen or where it was left when it was uh, left uh, gone. It didn't actually show you who had picked it up, except the police had a new tool. It's something you're probably familiar with. It's called Google. Uh, and what they did was they realized that almost everyone who has a Google-enabled device, either that's an Android phone or Gmail or the maps on your Apple phone or whatever it would be, uh, you would be able to ask Google, or at least the lawyers at Google, for access to the geolocation data. So what they did was they said, hey, we would like to have the geolocation data that matches the GPS data we have to figure out, are there any phones that went in the same path over and over? And lo and behold, they found an individual's phone, a guy named Melvin Thomas. And so they had a pretty good piece of evidence that Melvin Thomas had this pattern of stealing uh, trucks. But then they went farther. First, they then went to a judge and got another warrant for Melvin Thomas's um, data from the, his computer and his basically his phone. And what did they find? An internet search for the resale value of these forklifts that he was selling. They saw him Googling for the address of the lot that was broken into where it was stolen. They saw him searching for other heavy equipment places that were uh, later broken into. 
literally moments before the theft, they saw him Googling for directions to the place where they found him. They found on his phone, the Google map that showed exactly where he went and where he went and how he dropped off the, the uh, trucks. They found surveillance photos that mapped him and where he had gone. And then of course, because everyone seems to wanna Instagram their life, they also found photos on his iPhone of him with lots of money and the trucks. It's about as good as evidence as you could get. All Google, all Apple, all the kinds of things that we are building around ourselves with a little bit of surveillance devices uh, thrown in. Uh, and so what this project looks at is that what happens when data reveals our most personal uh, information, where we go, who we go with, what we do, what we like, and what happens when those digital systems are also built into our lived experience and exposes our public actions? Again, where we go, who we do things with, and, and what our interests are. And my argument is that these two stories, these stories of how we are trying to sell surveillance as a service, people are buying camera systems for their home, looking out, and paying companies money that not just surveils the, the porch outside their front door, but also their neighborhood and themselves. And we're paying money as cities to purchase uh, real-time crime center uh, video cameras, networked real-time crime center data centers, uh, facial recognition, drones, predictive policing software technologies. And we're doing it in a way that is amping up, challenging, and raising the bar of the amount of surveillance power local jurisdictions have in cities, but also in rural areas, and also the national you know, government, the police uh, uh, national police force, the FBI in the U.S. and other places. And the story that I'm trying to tell is that these two separate stories are intersecting in ways that we haven't quite processed, that we are building a digital net around ourselves that will be misused by governments. It will be misused by other people. It will also be used to catch, you know, the Melvin Thomases of the world when they do something um, dumb like steal a forklift. Um, and that has and creates tensions about whether or not we want this kind of technology out there. The, the argument that I'm going to sort of walk through with you is that we have in both our personal lives and our public lives changed the kind of power around us because of digital technologies. Um, the result is that everything is evidence and we haven't grappled with what that means for power, government power, personal privacy and our relationship uh, with police and governments and how that will be used and misused. We also haven't recognized how it's gonna change prosecution, like ordinary prosecution, in the same way we had a moment with uh, uh, forensics and like criminal forensics of DNA and those kinds of uh, technologies. We're gonna see it again with digital forensics. Um, as our faces become uh, commodified uh, by private companies and facial recognition, we're going to see that play out again in the public sphere. And that was talked about by the last speaker. A uh, geolocation of where we're able to go in public is going to change. And again, our biometrics, the iris scans that will get you some free Bitcoin or the face recognition that uh, is being rolled out in uh, uh, borders across uh, the, the world as you take planes across is going to change. Uh, power and change those dynamics. So to begin with story number one, my argument is, and again, uh, I, I don't want to presume this is definitely an American story at this moment. It may also be a, a story of other places that uh, are uh, buying into this world of smart technologies with little robots that will follow you around your home, little cameras that will watch your pets when they're gone. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the technologies, but the, the, this sort of desire for innovation is a desire for sort of digital self-recognition about some insight of your life uh, that people are paying for, not realizing that every digital innovation is also a surveillance technology. It's watching you in order to do the thing you wanted to do that, you know, tell you how many steps you've taken in a day or how far you've run. Um, but it's watching you to be able to do that. And those kinds of surveillance uh, technologies are in the U.S. at best a warrant away. Many times you don't even need like a judicial warrant to be able to get access to it. But if there's a crime and a judge will sign the warrant, everything we create, every piece of evidence we create 
is going to be available for uh, police. And just the question, of course, is whether uh, we're ready for that. Uh, so we can begin with our, our things. I gave a talk last week in front of the law school. It's the beginning of law school, fall semester. And so it was a room of the first year law students, 1Ls, uh, as we call them, probably about 300 students uh, in front of me. And I asked them this question. I said, all of you moved uh, somewhere to come to Washington, D.C. Uh, to uh, go to law school. How many of you, when you were moving, used a paper map? And people like literally laugh because no one has picked up a paper map in decades. These are all 20 somethings who have never used a paper map in their life. Or maybe if they did, they were working with their grandparents who had a paper map, no paper maps. And I asked them, OK, how many of you, you know, went on the Internet and, and put down you know, directions like MapQuest, like we used to have to do? No one. How many of you asked a stranger or a human being where the law school was or where someone was? No. What they do, they use their phones. Their phones had maps, their cars had maps, everything was a digitally uh, created map. And that makes sense because I do it too, everyone does it. Uh, and yet what they also realized, because they had to keep raising their hands, uh, was that every digital trail that they have ever taken is recorded and kept and is usable uh, and accessible by the government with a warrant. Uh, and so everything they've done since they've owned that phone can be tracked back to them. Same with their cars. Many cars nowadays, modern cars, are basically computers on wheels. And they are tracking uh, where we go and what we do and by inference, uh, you know, why we decided to go to that path. Are we going to a you know, medical clinic? Are we going to a, uh, you know, a, psych a, psychology, a psychiatrist's office? Are we going to court? It's all being tracked and it's all available. And not only is it available, it's also purchasable because private companies are doing it and they're reselling it. So even if the government doesn't want to go through the trouble of buying, getting a warrant, they can literally just buy the same data uh, from these companies. And some companies recognizing the market have created their own uh, geolocational data sets for police to purchase and use. They can just go on and find all those little free ads and apps that are on your phone are tracking devices, and they are being used by law enforcement to track people. And the law on this in the U.S. is pretty limited. At best, it says you need to have a warrant. There are a couple of cases that said, well, if you can do this kind of long term tracking, you should at least go to a judge and say we have a reason for this. Uh, but some of the apps and some of the sort of expectations that go into these, probably no warrant required, which means police have an incredibly new power to be able to watch anyone who has a digital technology device on them, be it a phone or a smart car or a Fitbit on, on their wrist. Uh, in ways that are, again, not something that they've ever, police have ever had before. So that's our things. What about our homes? We, we are, we, I say we, it's Americans. Uh, I'm not going to presume the Brazilians are following in our footsteps or other people around the world are following in our footsteps. But we seem to spend a lot of our excess money on dumb, smart things. Uh, and these smart things like uh, Alexa, Echo uh, devices in our homes or cameras to watch our pets, smart TVs we can talk to, uh, cameras on our doors are all dual surveillance devices. They are watching us to get insights about us. Uh, they're also watching others if that's what we want them to do. Uh, but they're all available if the police want them. And there's some interesting cases that are developed uh, where, let's say, there's you know murder in a house and police don't really know who did it or how it happened. But their cameras on the doors, their echoes listening in and there are clues about all the various sensors built into the house that can kind of piece together in digital form what actually happens. Pretty fascinating new way of doing um, policing and technologies. Same way police have used sort of external cameras, poll cameras, like long-term cameras, like on poles, watching homes. Uh, we're building in our public housing communities from our poor areas, uh, video cameras that, again, are being, you know, if one of the costs, unfortunately, of being poor is more surveillance. Uh, and we're seeing that in other places. So our homes are being surveilled in ways that never had happened, even as they used to be kind of this refuge where you could go when other things in public might not be uh, uh, free from surveillance. Our bodies were putting in uh, smart devices, in interesting cases. Uh, one involved a smart pacemaker where a guy uh, burned down his own house and then claimed it was you know, an accident, tried to get the insurance money. 
Uh, and it turned out that the story he gave police was refuted by the smart pacemaker in his heart that the police went to the doctor's office and got uh, because he had a story how he was running up and down the things to save all of his things and save his dog and how tired he was. And his pacemaker during the whole time was like completely smooth. And they used it to impeach him and said, this is insurance fraud. We know what you did. Uh, and like his heart, his pacemaker gave him away. Same thing happens and is happening in certain states in the U.S. where abortion and, and reproductive rights are being criminalized. Uh, a lot of uh, women use uh, uh, apps that track their periods or menstrual cycles. And that data, which is very helpful for health reasons, can also now be obtained by governments who are looking to use it for prosecution. Uh, you know, facial recognition, genetic testing, all of that is almost old school now compared to the new ways we are uh, surveilling ourselves and our bodies and now making that available to police uh, for future prosecution. Our papers, right, what we Google, um, what we text, like we're, we are digital animals where we communicate uh, most things uh, via some form of technology, like the one we're using right now to communicate uh, across countries. It is digital, it is recorded, it is recordable, and it means that there is always going to be a trail there. Uh, many people use smart payment systems uh, where you're not necessarily using cash, which is pretty much undiscoverable, but you're using a, a payment system that records like where you were when you bought what you bought, also what you bought, and can create a, a trail of like who you are via your purchases. Again, very helpful for police when they're tracking you down, very uh, problematic for people who would like to buy things that rather the government not know. Um, but can't because of these digital payment systems. Also health records, Google searches, it, it's all our papers. And then of course our likes. You know, if you go back in history, one of the most dangerous things that has ever happened from a surveillance sense has been an idea that the government would create dossiers on individuals, be able to find out your greatest likes or dislikes, your secrets, your hidden things. And the reality is like, we're creating our own dossiers on ourselves and they're all available to the government, at least with a warrant. Um, the idea that almost all of our like true or maybe even fake truths, and obviously we don't all live Instagram lives, lives um, you know, uh, is available to the government to piece together who we associate with, who we like, is obviously impacting you know, uh, advocates who want to protest policing, who want to protest parts of our government, want to get together using digital communications like everything else. And in many ways, almost everything we do in that digital realm is obtainable uh, by the police, at least, again, with a warrant, uh, changing the dynamics and the powers uh, that exist. And so the moral of like story number one is that we've built this kind of self-surveillance trap. Like if the data trails exist, they're going to be obtained by law enforcement. There's a crime. They're allowed to get it in that way. And they very well uh, might. Parallel to that story is number two, the story number two, which is this idea that communities are investing our tax money, our money in new surveillance uh, systems that are not like the old surveillance systems. We've always had surveillance systems, we've always had these cameras. But what is happening is the nature of the technology is changing in ways we haven't really been paying attention to. And so we're talking about things like real-time crime centers, sort of video analytic uh, CCTV cameras that are not just standalone cameras, but are also coming back to a central command center where you can watch the streets, you know, go back in time, basically get you have a time machine of what is happening in public, predictive policing technologies, automated license plate readers, like being able to scan cars and where they go in their patterns, facial recognition, drones, gunshot detection. All of these are not just standalone tools, but they're becoming systems of surveillance that when aggregated together are more powerful than we've ever seen them or even considered them as tools. And I don't think that we, or the, the idea is to bring up the fact that we really haven't focused on how the, uh, the, the combination of all of these technologies is going to change these power dynamics in ways we haven't seen. And we really are building uh, systems of surveillance in ways that are uh, quite powerful and potentially quite uh, terrifying. And so what I want to just do quickly here is explain why this is different. And I have two arguments that maybe you accept, maybe you don't. But one that even just the nature of the digitization of policing is different. Like what is happening, the act and the result and what you get from what police are doing is just actually different. And I'll show that in a second. And the second is that there's actually something 
also even more harmful about this kind of long-term surveillance, this always under surveillance world. It's not just as a particular crime problem, we have a particular, particular tool we'll, 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 we will roll out. It is that this is the, the lived experience, this is the way you live under persistent surveillance. So here are just two quick examples or two quick discussions. The first is why digital policing is different. I make the argument in a couple of law review articles that are online, if anyone wants to find them, that really what is happening here hasn't been considered to be different, even though it is. We picture a police officer doing their job investigating a crime uh, as if they were the human officer doing just with a fancy tool, some new technology. But really what is happening is a different uh, act, that the automated nature of this camera always rolling, the accumulating data, the accuracy, even of course there are mistakes, but the accuracy of being able to roll through thousands of hours of tape to find a particular face or particular hat or particular bag, um, the aggregation of all of these data trails at once, the acceleration, the speed on which we can do it, and the fact that it can be used over and over again, actualized in a way, is actually different. It's not the same thing as a human officer, like in a stakeout, watching the person they think did something wrong, that the, the scale of power is different and the result is different. What police can now do with that information is something that they couldn't do before. Uh, they couldn't do it because it's a, a system, not a tool. They couldn't do it because it's deeper and broader. They could, couldn't, they never had the ability to search. Like now we can literally search through a city's worth of footage to find one person over time in ways that it just would have been impossible. Imagine watching like VHS footage over a city. It would take you, you know, a year to do. Um, and it has like legal, legal ramifications. I won't talk too much about the Fourth Amendment, um, but legal ramifications about uh, a changing what police can do and how they can do it. And thus, of course, what individuals can do. It's also, of course, just an upgrade away from changing again. You can literally in Chicago, there are 30,000 video cameras that are sort of connected together through these different uh, mini uh, districts. Uh, they don't have facial recognition at this moment, uh, but they could flip the switch. They have the software, they can change it. And that's the danger of these digital technologies is that they are upgradable. You can just change them. Um, you know, this is sort of a, a slide that talks about some of the law behind it. But like in the U.S., we basically have this analog law, this old non-digital law that says, well, you know, if a plane can fly over your yard, you really don't have any reason to expect privacy. And the question is, well, is that different than a plane flying over an entire city and recording everything at once? I think it is. Um, but there's an open question because the law in the U.S. hasn't caught up. We have said that you can put a beeper on a car and track it. And that's not really a Fourth Amendment problem. It's not a constitutional problem. But what about like GPS tracking all cars, which they actually can do? It's like baked into your, your, your car system now. And the point being that the analog law that currently exists is outdated and needs an upgrade and needs some conversation about, about what can happen. And this isn't like science fiction. It, it's real in terms of what's happening. Just as one example of like the dangers and damages of persistent surveillance. In Baltimore, Maryland, city outside of Washington, D.C., the Baltimore Police Department used a Cessna plane, like one of those kind of small planes, filled with cameras that were originally created to surveil Afghanistan and Iraq and film the entire city at once. They could just fly a plane for 12 hours at a time and literally record the entire city at once. And then they had playback capability where they were able to say, oh, go back and find the you know, burglary uh, that was reported at the corner of 4th and Elm Street. And they could then uh, find the house, find the car, and trace back the car for where the burglars went. They literally were able to watch protests. They were able to watch individuals going about their daily business. And it was a new form of police power that had no analog. We didn't have a, an example of where we've ever had this citywide capability. And I would argue, and I've argued in, in articles that, again, are, are available if anyone wants to read them, uh, about how this is a different kind of harm, that the digital nature, the aggregated nature, the ability to go retrospective is different. Something is different in what is happening uh, needs to be seen as different, uh, because if you just sort of take the old fashioned analog, well, we've always done this kind of watching our communities, you're not really seeing the harms, you're not seeing what happens. Uh, and so the, the moral of story two is that these systems of citywide surveillance are being developed and integrated in ways that are damaging to uh, personal privacy and, and enhancing of police power. 
without really any sort of in the U.S. legal pushback uh, to limit them in, in any significant way. Um, I make the argument that this is changing, as you've heard me say, power, privacy, so the practical reality, and is impacted by privatization. But I want to make that just a bit more concrete uh, before I wrap up. So the power problems are that the problems you may have with policing uh, and who police targets, whether it's sort of economic driven, whether it's sort of racially driven, um, only gets exacerbated with these new forms of technology because the ability to do the same policing uh, exists, but just with greater ease. Uh, and so what we've seen is that when these technologies have been rolled out, they've generally been used to target the same groups of people who police have long targeted, namely poor people, in the U.S., it tends to be black and brown men uh, in ways that are just as discriminatory as the old policing uh, and in some ways reifies some of the same um, problems. They also have like a hidden power problem where the police themselves lose a bit of power to the companies because the companies now have the ability to control the data streams and the information in ways that they never had before. And it's actually a strange, strange inversion where the race to become the platform for policing, the desire to become like the sole source provider of digital services for police makes that platform really powerful in ways even the police haven't fully comprehended. But all of us in the world should be really worried about if we're sort of transferring uh, this sort of what used to be public power, public safety responsibility to private hands. Privacy problems. Um, the privacy problems might be evident to you as we have essentially exposed you know, our bodies and our homes and our activities to police in ways that we hadn't before. Um, it also exposes the reality that, at least in the U.S., there's almost no place that is off limits, no data that's off limits to police. It's kind of a fascinating thing to think about, that, that we almost always will prioritize prosecution over privacy with a warrant there isn't anything that is probably off limits, even the most sensitive personal thing, if police can say it has some connection to a criminal case. From your heartbeat to your you know, uh, reproductive health, there is almost nothing, as long as there's a crime associate, that you can keep uh, hidden. And, and that's a problem of how we've defined privacy, the narrowing of privacy that we've only used in the US, sort of constitutional terms for privacy or statutory terms, both of which or neither of which really address the, the scope of how privacy is being limited and changed. And we have no language for things that sort of evoke associational privacy. What I mean by that is what happens when, as happens in my neighborhood as I'm looking around, every house puts a ring doorbell sold by Amazon on their front door looking out. The, we, we being that I have not done this, but the neighbors have created essentially a private circle of surveillance that affects everyone's privacy, but we don't really have a good language for thinking about how that privacy is impacted because in the US, privacy has always been personal. We don't have a associational neighborly privacy concept. And the rise of this technology has sort of revealed uh, that limit. There's some real praxis problems, some of which are maybe uh, dependent or sort of focused on the US, which we can skim through. But one is in almost all of the experiments that we've seen, uh, it's always been touted as a pilot. Don't worry, it's just a pilot. It'll change. The Baltimore cameras and the, the, the spy plane over Baltimore, just a pilot. It'll change. But of course, if you're just dealing with pilots, you never actually have a moment where you can have accountability to determine whether or not it worked or not because it'll just create another pilot. And so it's an always moving ball to be able to regulate or challenge or limit because it keeps changing. There's a money problem. The technology companies uh, are investing in this. They're making money and they're using it very well. Uh, they're using it you know, to their advantage. There's a probability problem in the sense of a lot of the algorithms and issues of sort of predictive analytics are based on other people, not you. And as we bake those into our policing systems, it means we are judging other people based on what even other people did. And the question of whether that's uh, really uh, uh, correct. Uh, and you know, there's an error problem. When people make mistakes. Uh, every time we've rolled out these technologies, we've learned the hard way that they haven't actually worked. Uh, that real people got harmed. Uh, they weren't really well thought out. And we're doing it again with new technologies and new surveillance uh, uh, situations. Whose fault is it? I submit it's our fault. 
both as a personal uh, choice to to buy these technologies and put you know smart devices on your wrists or in your body, but also the democratic challenge. Our governments are doing this on our behalf. And the people to to blame are, you know, obviously the pressure, people are putting pressure on from technology companies, but it's us too. Uh, and thus, we also have the power to do something about it if we'd like to change and challenge sort of this rise of these two stories that are changing our world. Um, last, uh, you know, uh, substantive slide here uh, about solutions is like in the, the project I'm working on, the book I'm working on, I have sort of an all of the above approach of everything that we need to do in terms of changing. It's primarily U.S. focus, but U.S. law, U.S. Uh, interpretations of the Constitution, individual choices. Um, but I, I say, and I've read this article called Surveillance and the Tyrant Test, that again, is available if anyone wants to find it free online, is, is essentially we do need to start thinking about the fact that we are creating the, the seeds of tyranny. And we have seen in America how authoritarianism uh, can rear its head. And if you would take a, a, a president who would misuse that authoritarian power and take the technologies that exist with um, uh, the data systems there, you will have all of the tools and systems you need for a pretty tyrannical uh, situation. So you should begin with that. You should assume that's going to happen and then figure out what are you going to do? Maybe there are certain technologies you don't buy or you don't invest in. Maybe there are other limits that would make it very hard for the tyrant to use it. But if you begin with the assumption that this will be misused, you actually get to some interesting um, places with what you would do about uh, certain technologies and how you would roll them out. And this is just the final, final slide or second to final slide. But all of this, to, all of this fear that has been part and parcel of this talk has to be taken, you know, in the same light as a recognition that police will use this to solve crimes we want solved, like the forklift, uh, like a murder, uh, like a sexual assault, crimes we really want solved. And the same technologies that are creating the tyrant will help police uh, solve those cases in ways that we might be okay with. And that tension is really hard. Um, and with that, I'll stop because I, I went slightly over time. Uh, but thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to answer any questions or, or continue the discussion. Muito obrigada, Andrew, pela palestra. Foi excelente a sua fala. É, acredito que todos nós tenhamos aprendido muito. É, e a gente vai ter agora um breve momento para ouvir questões da audiência. É, eu tenho uma questão, mas eu queria ver primeiro se alguém da plateia queria comentar alguma coisa. Ah, ali, você pode vir até aqui? Só peço para que você se... Ah, ali. Acho que é Mas em português. Isso, português. Só peço para que você se apresente. Boa noite, professor Andrew. É, meu nome é Pedro. Eu sou estudante de pós-graduação aqui da faculdade. É, a minha pergunta é muito prática no seguinte sentido. É, as soluções que são enumeradas no fim, ou seja, como enfrentar esse movimento, passam, como o senhor disse, pela questão judicial, legislativa, individual, comunitária, etc., eu queria fazer uma pergunta muito prática no sentido se existe um movimento das cortes nos Estados Unidos judiciais criando precedentes de resistência a isso ou se não, se as vozes na academia estão isoladas nesse sentido ou se requisitos mais fortes do que somente um mandado estão sendo exigidos em alguns casos, etc. Obrigado. So that's a great question. Um, there are three parts to that. So one is I do think that some judges and courts are concerned that these new technologies are uh, changing the old order, the, the balance that existed. I think, unfortunately, most of those same judges that express concern also feel somewhat constrained by the fact that the Supreme Court hasn't fully acted uh, in this realm. They've had a couple cases where they've dealt with like long-term uh, surveillance of GPS and of cell site locations of tracking your phone. Um, but they've left a whole lot of questions open. Uh, and it's hard for a judge who's not, you know, who's on a, a lower court uh, to reach out and try to expand sort of the interpretation of how privacy might play out. But some have, for example, the Baltimore spy plane was challenged in court and uh, the the dis the trial judge said it was fine, didn't violate the Constitution. 
a court of appeals said it was fine. It didn't violate the Constitution. But then uh, the en banc for circuit, meaning the full court, viewed it again. And a, a majority of that court said it actually did violate the Fourth Amendment, did violate an expectation policy. So there's some movement of judges to do it. But I think in truth, even the judges are looking for the language and theory and ideas behind uh, how uh, technology has changed things and thus how the law might adapt. And so I don't think academics are isolated. I think that there's a dialogue going on about how to rethink some of these older you know, doctrinal protections uh, in a new world. And that conversation is going on and hopefully spurred by law students from all over the world who are engaging these issues and thinking about them and reading the scholarship about there and and coming up with new ideas because maybe you'll have the idea that changes things uh, in the in you know in in the future. Obrigada, Andrew. Um, acho que eu vou ah tem mais uma pergunta ali e depois eu vou emendar a minha também. Pode vir. Oh. Boa noite, professor. Meu nome é Aristides Moura, eu sou advogado de uma empresa de tecnologia aqui no Brasil. E a minha pergunta para o senhor, se eu entendi direito, uh, o senhor falou que as empresas de tecnologia, uh, em algum momento, ou por, por algum motivo, elas têm uh, começado a comercializar esses dados, ou, ou galhar esses dados, e comercializá-los de forma que Uh, eles podem estar disponíveis uh, para as autoridades mediante compra uh, e, e, e com isso seria uma forma de burlar a reserva de, de jurisdição, ou seja, a necessidade de um mandado para se ter acesso a, esse, a essas informações. A minha pergunta é como que essa disponibilização desses dados, como é que essas empresas se, se, são responsabilizadas face às leis de proteção de dados? Aqui no Brasil nós temos a LGPD, na Europa a GDPR, nos Estados Unidos há semelhantes institutos. Como que é a relação dessa dessa situação com essa proteção legal que, que, é, que é dada a partir das leis de proteção de dados? Obrigado. Posso mandar a minha pergunta também, Andrew? É, aqui no Brasil... A gente está tendo uma discussão agora no Supremo Tribunal Federal, um tema de repercussão geral, que trata sobre o tema número 1148, inclusive, que trata sobre busca reversa. Né? Então, a prática de autoridades buscarem por dados de pessoas indeterminadas sem determinação de suspeitos, né? previamente. E eu queria te ouvir um pouco a respeito dessa prática, como que está a discussão nos Estados Unidos a respeito disso, os limites e a, enquanto né, os limites de legalidade dessa prática que tem né, tá sendo discutida aqui no Brasil quanto à legalidade dela. Acho que é isso. Obrigada. Sure. So you know, to the first point, the U.S. does not have strong data protection laws of personal data. There is no national uh, protection like Europe has in some capacity. Uh, and even the state, uh, uh, there are, there's a handful, about five state U U.S. states that are, have their own data protection, but they're focused on the consumer side, uh, namely the what the consumer companies can do. And they generally have carve outs for law enforcement. So uh, on one hand, the law enforcement, sometimes it's easier for them to use a warrant just to get it. Uh, but two, in the the places where the data is essentially barred from resale or you have control, there's usually a, a carve out for government access. So the government can still get it. That's why there's actually a, a, um, a bill, it's not a law, it's a bill, a proposed law in the US called the Fourth Amendment is not for sale bill uh, that Ron Wyden, Senator Ron Wyden has proposed, which basically says this loophole where the police can't get something with a warrant, but could just purchase the same data from Google or the equivalent, um, seems wrong and that we should have a law on it. Unfortunately, we don't yet have a law on it, nor do we have terribly strong consumer privacy laws uh, like other countries do, which is you know, one level of, of protection. Uh, separately, in terms of looking at police taking the existing data and using it to 
target individuals perhaps before they have uh, committed crime. It's not so much for investigation, but sort of uh, looking at who might be involved in criminal activity or what groups might be uh, in charge, you know, might be responsible. We've definitely seen that. Uh, social media has been a boon for law enforcement just to monitor people. A lot of what I, when I'm talking about surveillance, I'm actually really talking about monitoring. It's not even so much of investigation all the time. Sometimes it's, it's just the ability to watch. And one of the things about the camera systems that are in place is that if there's no law that says you can't watch all the streets with your fancy digital surveillance cameras, and thus you can, um, you can use it for any purpose. And so if you're worried about, let's say, there's a group of people that are protesting the police or protesting the government or are journalists trying to uncover some kind of wrongdoing in the community, um, the police can watch them without any legal. There's no legal pushback to say you can't do that because we have said in the old laws, the traditional analog laws, that you really have no expectation of privacy in public, and you've shared this data with third parties, so why do you get to claim any expectation with that? And yet, of course, that opening allows police to misuse or potentially misuse uh, data to go after disfavored groups um, to enhance people with power, with people who don't have power, uh, and you know, target political dissenters and everything else. And it's a real risk. Um, we see it. Of course, it's also used to target people who police really think are involved in violent action. Uh, and, you know, they monitor those groups, those gangs as well. Obrigada, Andrew. Queria abrir para mais uma rodada de perguntas, caso alguém tenha ali. Peço para Professor, obrigado pela palestra. Eu sou o Ana Maiângelo, sou aluno do doutorado aqui da faculdade. Eu gostaria de saber a sua opinião sobre como sistemas como a divisão da Polícia de Los Angeles, o RACR, causam tensões raciais, principalmente pelo uso de Black Data, e se o Blue Data pode ser uma, uma solução para essas tensões raciais. So, and thank you uh, for that question, that insightful question. Uh, so uh, the, the problem of race and policing is real and intertwined in America. And the addition of new digital technologies, whether it's predictive policing or camera systems, doesn't change that calculus. Uh, and in fact, it may exacerbate some of it. And so LA is a great example because LA really embraced a lot of the technologies uh, early on. Uh, and they did it with a police department that has been notorious for racialized policing and racist policing. Uh, and so a lot of the targeting of where that surveillance uh, was deployed was, again, those same poor communities and communities of color. And so I think it has created a tension in that the people who are being surveilled have obviously responded and protested. And in some ways, you know, L.A. is an interesting example because the community who protested did so effectively enough that they're actually able to shut down some of those systems. So predictive policing, which really got its sort of national debut in Los Angeles, was also shut down in Los Angeles because the activist community uh, pushed back and challenged it and called it out for not working, but also for being uh, racially biased. Uh, and there was a, a sense that uh, in LA, where they were experimenting with person-based predictive policing, like identify people who might be involved in crime and place-based predictive policing, that both had uh, enough problems that they were able to shut it down. Now, the truth, of course, is that LA has expanded its big data capabilities. It has expanded its investment in digital technologies. And it is probably just as data-driven as it was, just without the buzzword of predictive policing. Um, but it does give an interesting example. You ask sort of, I think the flip side of this is like, you know, the, the, the duality of surveillance is that it watches you uh, as much as you know, you're watching it. Uh, and that's also true with police. So, for example, police departments are also under surveillance. Those cameras watching the city are also watching police do their jobs. And there's an open question about whether uh, we could use some of the video analytics technologies, citywide cameras, to monitor police in ways that we've never monitored before. 
one of the things I always point out is that in cities that have problematic policing uh, and that are being investigated by, like in the U.S., the Department of Justice would investigate, you actually can use the same video analytics technologies baked into those video systems, those camera systems, to monitor police in very granular ways where you'd be able to find some of the misconduct you know exists on camera. You just have to have the political will to want to do it. And we haven't really seen that political will, but strangely, the technologies uh, are revealing and can reveal uh, misconduct. And again, with that, if you had the desire to do it, you could use technology to improve some of the worst instances of police misconduct and brutality. Obrigada, Angel. Bom, eu acredito que a gente não tenha mais perguntas da plateia, então eu queria que você fizesse suas considerações finais, se possível, e te agradecer novamente, imensamente, por aceitar participar desse momento com a gente, né? I just want to say thank you for listening and interrogating uh, these issues. Uh, these are uh, hard questions that uh, impact uh, many countries uh, in different ways. Um, I like to tell the American story because I think we've messed it up so much that sometimes it's a good cautionary tale uh, for other countries. Um, but I think other countries have their own unique ways of messing things up in their ways. Uh, and so you too probably have lessons that you could explain uh, to us about how these technologies are being misused. I really do think, you know, from the U.S. perspective, that we're going to be at a moment where it's almost too late, where we have built the systems in our homes and our lives and just become natural uh, about how we get on with our lives in a way where we won't be able to easily escape. And it worries me uh, that it's too easy to abuse by either national authoritarian like governments or even local authoritarian like governments. Uh, and that we haven't really uh, thought about um, what to do next. And so I, I encourage you to join that conversation, the international conversation. Uh, if people have great ideas, maybe we could have you come out to American uh, University, uh, Washington College of Law and present some of these ideas and, and continue uh, the, the international uh, dialogue. And so thank you very, very much for the opportunity. Muito obrigada, Angel. É, bom, eu acho que ambas as palestras deram um ótimo começo para a gente nessa semana, nesse congresso. Né? É, a Zade falando sobre vigilância e autoritarismo e a dificuldade da gente conceitualizar o que que é como a gente conceitualiza o que que é o autoritarismo é, e como a vigilância entra nesse sentido é, e especialmente num, num contexto num país como o nosso né no sul global um país subdesenvolvido é, e o Andrew veio com muita informação relacionada a como os nossos dados dados que a gente usa rotineiramente cotidianamente têm sido utilizados também como insumo para investigações policiais e como isso pode é, ser nocivo né, pra, também para a nossa democracia. E democracia foi o tema que a gente escolheu para ser o tema do Congresso desse ano, porque é o tema da vez, eu acho. Né? Eu acho que desde que o ano começou, a gente tem falado muito sobre isso e como as tecnologias impactam a democracia e como também podem ser eventualmente utilizadas até para... É, evitar que a democracia seja corrompida. Então, acredito que esse tema seja bastante relevante para essa discussão atual. E a gente pensou nos painéis, nos painéis, nos pais, painéis, meu Deus, painéis desse ano, justamente pensando nesse fio condutor, né? Então, amanhã a gente começa às nove da manhã com o painel sobre spywares e o uso de dados por órgãos de defesa nacional que eu acho que também é um tema super atual e que tem sido bastante discutido hoje em dia e é um tema espinhoso, é um tema difícil também de ser tratado. É, logo em seguida, a gente vai ter uma discussão sobre criptografia, sobre a varredura pelo lado do cliente, que é uma técnica que tem sido utilizada também para investigações criminais e que tem sido discutida no âmbito de projetos de lei nos Estados Unidos e no Reino Unido. Mas aqui no Brasil isso também foi, em algum momento, ventilado, quando a gente estava falando do, 20, do PL 2630, né? então do projeto que falava ali, ficou né? conhecido como projeto das fake news, mas que, tratava, né? que trata de maneira mais geral sobre a responsabilização de empresas, é, de internet e de plataformas, é, e acredito que vai ser um momento riquíssimo também de discussão. 
Amanhã, é, logo no final da tarde, às 5 horas, a gente vai ter uma discussão sobre câmeras corporais utilizadas por é, forças policiais, que no ano passado, especialmente durante as eleições estaduais, foi um tema muito tratado, especialmente aqui em São Paulo, acho que talvez no Rio de Janeiro também, mas muito tratado em debates é, e né, quais são os limites e possibilidades dessa prática, como que isso impacta a atuação policial. Logo depois, já emendando nessa discussão sobre capacidades é, policiais, a gente vai ter uma discussão sobre o uso de inteligência artificial. Né? Então, a gente vai mergulhar um pouco mais nisso que o Andrew trouxe nessa palestra e falar sobre policiamento preditivo, sobre o uso de inteligência artificial, sobre o uso de reconhecimento facial, como isso tem sido utilizado hoje é, pelas polícias. E, na sexta-feira, a gente vai encerrar com uma discussão sobre vigilância privada. Qual que é o limite da vigilância privada em espaços públicos? Como que essa, hoje em dia né, a gente tem visto é, uma explosão de câmeras, 24 horas, 7 dias por semana, que ficam nas vizinhanças, tanto de São Paulo como do Rio de Janeiro, que têm seus dados também compartilhados é, com a autoridade de investigação. E a gente vai discutir também quais são os limites, qual que é a legalidade é, dessa, dessa, dessa atividade. E encerramos falando sobre o legislativo, sobre como essa discussão, essa discussão sobre os dados, tratamento de dados para investigação criminal, como que isso está sendo hoje colocado no âmbito do legislativo no Congresso Nacional. Né? A gente tem dois projetos de lei que vão tratar a respeito disso, que tem tratado a respeito disso, um que é a reforma do Código de Processo Penal, que está falando, tem um capítulo específico sobre provas digitais, e o outro que, na verdade, é um projeto de lei que ainda não foi apresentado, mas que já foi bastante discutido por uma comissão de juristas, que é o projeto de LGPD Penal. Então, um projeto de tratamento de dados aplicado aí à esfera penal, que foi uma das exceções colocadas pela nossa Lei de Proteção de Dados. É, eu acredito que vai ser uma discussão riquíssima, então... É, tudo isso espera por nós durante os próximos dias. Eu espero que vocês tenham um ótimo congresso. É, tudo isso foi preparado também com muito carinho e há bastante tempo, como a Marta comentou, desde o início do ano que a gente tem pensado em todos os painéis. E eu queria aqui também fazer alguns agradecimentos. Primeiro, ao Jus Brasil, que topou apoiar a gente financeiramente na realização do congresso desse ano. A professora Marta Sade, novamente, por apoiar a gente na execução do congresso. É, todos os anos já há algum tempo. É, e também falar para vocês que a gente, durante essa semana, também está realizando uma mostra de filmes. É, uma mostra de filmes em parceria com a Finos Filmes e com Belas Artes. Então, quatro filmes relacionados à temática de vigilância e democracia vão ficar disponíveis online é, para acesso na plataforma do Belas Artes Alacarte. Quem quiser é só entrar na plataforma do Belas Artes Alacarte, eles estarão ali disponíveis. É, são filmes bastante interessantes, eu estou curiosíssima para vê-los. É, e vai ficar disponível entre hoje e o dia 2 de setembro. Então, quem não conseguir ver durante a semana, ainda tem o um final de semana para conseguir assistir. É, acho que é isso. A gente agora vai partir para um coquetel, que vai começar na sala São Leopoldo, é isso? São Leopoldo. Do outro lado, tem que atravessar aqui o corredor para chegar até ali. E é isso, gente. Eu espero que vocês tenham uma ótima noite. Obrigada.